Amen. Matthew chapter 24. That's where we're going to be. We're moving on. You say we're not going to be stuck on verse 22 anymore. No, we won't. <laughs> Amen. We weren't stuck. We weren't stuck. Amen. Are you ready to meet the Lord tonight? Amen. You can come back tonight. You never know. Amen. Amen. You, you know, thing, everything will be left behind. Everyone will be left behind that's not saved. Amen. You need to know the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand. I'll read the three passages, verses 23, 24, and 25, and uh, we'll get into the passage. And uh, so verse, and we'll probably focus mostly, of course, on verse 24. And uh, so verse 23, then, if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. <clears throat> Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Give us understanding. Speak to hearts. Meet with needs. Lord, God, fill me and use me. Lord God, fill my cup tonight. Lord, so I thank you for those, uh, a, Lord God, were able to come out tonight. Pray for those who weren't. Lord God, those who are not well. I pray, Father, you would just uh, help them, encourage them, strengthen them also. So, God, we do thank you, that, uh, Lord God, for salvation. Now, God, bless our time as we lift you up this evening, Lord God. And, God, we look into your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. And, again, if you look at the, the context of these verses, um, we've been dealing with the last half of the tribulation. The midpoint was in verse 15 when the abomination of desolation took place. So we're still in that time frame, even though it seems like um, it's kind of a repetition in these passages, back to verse 4, let's say, that Jesus said or answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And again, some of that sounds very, very familiar in the passage here. So, but what I want you to see tonight, and again, in this time, there is going to be a lot of chaos in the world. If you look around what's going on tonight, you can see we're starting to see more chaos in our world tonight. Amen? It's all in preparation for that Daniel 70th week, the great tribulation, which not one saint of God, not one who's part of the bride of Christ will be part of. And thank God for that. Amen? And uh, so anyway, the Bible tells us, if you remember back so many lessons about God's chosen people, I, I, I shared with you a, a wilderness journey, amen? The nation of Israel are, it, it has a, a, a wilderness journey, and God's going to preserve a remnant in that area, amen? And he's warning God's people. He's warning the people of God, his earthly physical people. The main context of the book of the gospel of Matthew is the nation of Israel. A lot of things that he speaks, Christ speaks on is related to the Jews, amen? He, those are his chosen people, his special earthly physical people people, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he warns them in this thing. And he says, it will be, of course, a time. It will be a time during the Antichrist will reign. You'll have the false prophet. It's interesting because the Antichrist, when you study this, and we're not going to get into a lot of details of this, but the Antichrist is like a political leader. And then you've got the false prophet, which is like a religious leader. And it's like religion will be more in agreement with all the philosophies of the government, which are beginning, as we see, even as we live in this day and age, becoming more and more ungodly and unbiblical. And they will be coming together. You see that in a lot of the religions tonight, where there's a, a, been a big movement for the last 20, 30 years towards a one-world church. And the only way you can have a one-world church is you've got to discard, I'm telling you, many things out of this Bible, because there's no way you're going to get everybody to agree on what God said. Because this book is not a, a, a book that people will have embraced and are not embracing tonight. 
because they find it too very narrow. They're finding it very restrictive. They're finding it very exclusive in some ways how God says, here's how you're supposed to live. And here is the narrow way unto salvation. It's not a wide road, amen? And all those things, and the world doesn't like that. They got this idea of inclusivity, including everybody. Everybody's okay, and nobody's wrong, and there's no sin, and everybody's good, and do your own thing, and whatever. However you feel about it, that's fine by me. Listen, you know what? The Bible doesn't throw that at you. It says, here's how to live. Amen? Here's how to keep a society stable in 2022. You follow this, the, this book tonight and the precepts of the Word of God. I'll tell you something. You will have a, a more stabler society than we got going on tonight. It's because this world, there's our government in Canada, our governments across the world have turned against God. They have forgotten God. You know, the, um, in, in the parliament billings, there's a verse, I think it's from Psalm 103, where it says, he shall have, it's a quote from the Bible, inscribed in the buildings of parliament that says, he shall have dominion from sea to sea. I wish God did have dominion from sea to sea across Canada. Look at the world. Look at our mess that's going on tonight. Amen? So you know what? I thank God. You think this is bad. It'll get so much worse in the tribulation, and God's going to spare us out of that period. He's not going to spare you from trials and tribulations right now, but he will spare you from that great tribulation, that seven-year time. Amen? You know, the Lord said that in this world you shall have tribulation. Jesus said that in the Gospel of John. You're going to have problems and trials, amen? But thank God tonight that we know we have a hope. We're looking forward to something, amen? Uh, there's some things I, I was hoping for something to be announced today. It didn't happen. So anyway, but that's all right. My hope's in Christ, amen? My hope's in Jesus Christ. Thank God for that, amen? Man, if it was related, listen, you know what? Yes, our feelings and our emotions are affected by this in our spirit, small s, not the Holy Spirit, this, our spirit, amen, is affected by things in this world. But you know what? I just don't want those things to control my life, amen? I don't want them to control my life. I want to be under the Holy Spirit control tonight, amen? So anyway, but uh, there is going to be a time. And back in Revelation, we'll go to there for a minute. Here, we'll just look, take a quick peek. We're not going to do an in-depth study. Of course, not on that right now. As you know, in Matthew 24, we have gone back and forth to the book of Revelation. Chapter 13, chapter 13. And, and many of you know, you know about this thing. And um, so some people got this wild idea that, you know, the vaccination was a mark of the beast. Listen, this is not a statement pro or against the, the, the vaccination situation. It's a statement that has nothing to do with it. They said it was the mark of the beast. They said, you know, the, the arrow, the point, you know, of the point of the needle is like the arrow in the verses when you read this in chapter 30. Really? You're really stretching something here. I'm sorry. By the way, you can't have the mark of the beast if you're saved because you won't be here for it. And this hasn't happened yet. So people got their Bible all messed up because, you know, they can't rightly divide the Bible. You know what? I could, I could write something. I could make a, write a book about it, and I could wrench the, stri the Scriptures out of context. I, you know, I could take a phrase out of the Bible. I could teach anything under the sun. But if I study the Bible in its context, there's no way you can teach that where you're, you, you tonight can have the mark of the beast tonight. Isn't that something? But well, that's where some Christians are at. I'm talking about people who are truly saved. I'm not talking about lost people, but that's what they think because they don't know the Bible. They spend too much time on YouTube. That's what we're using, by the way. <laughs> Amen. They're spending too much time on YouTube. They're spending too much time reading everything that's on the Internet. Listen, as well as good stuff on the Internet, there's a lot of false teaching and, and, and terror, junk on there. You got to be careful. How do you how, how do you know what it, what's good and bad? And you'll find out in a few minutes here. You know what? You got to know the truth. The truth will make you free. Amen. It saves your soul and it help you keep you straight <laughs> and understanding some things. When you hear somebody on a radio or you read this book or you heard this on social media, you say, "Huh, I wonder about that," and you're getting a little confused. Read the Bible. 
So what happens here? Well, the Bible says, you know what? He talks about this fact. Look over at verse, um, uh, let's see here, verse 16. Amen? Uh, um, let's see here. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand. Notice the word in. In, not on. Did you notice? Well, it's, you know, it's a tattoo of swords, preacher. Really? It says in. It says in their right hand or in their foreheads. How about that? It's something in there, okay? <laughs> Amen? And what? So that verse 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I know this for a fact. During the tribulation time, you could not buy or sell unless you had that mark in your hand or in your forehead. And you know what's happening today? There are things, I really believe there's things working towards that end. There really is. Just watch what's going on around you tonight. Just, just watch and listen what's going on. Amen? Restricting people from buying and selling. Mm -hmm. Come on. Amen? I didn't say that was the mark of the beast. Don't misunderstand that statement. I'm just saying getting used to people doing, not doing some things, taking freedoms and liberties from you. That's what's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to take away their freedom completely, and you have to have the mark in your hand or in your forehead in order to buy or sell. That's what's happening. Amen. So it's getting this world used to that. It's amazing. Amen. It's amazing how compliant the world is. Have you seen that? That's how it works. Amen. People are, you know, you know, you know a lot of the motivation in our world tonight is fear. It's fear. But unfortunately, some Christians have the spirit of fear, which the Lord says, he didn't, God didn't give it to you. He gave you the um, power and love and a sound mind. He never gave you that. If you've got a spirit of fear, you need to spend more time with God. Amen. I'm not worried about all this stuff. Amen. You know, I know this thing that's going on with the truckers. Man, praise the Lord. Okay. You might have your thoughts and opinions. You say, I don't think they should do that. Listen, aren't you glad we live in... I guess to a certain degree, a country that you still have some rights and freedoms to do some things? You could be living in a communist nation tonight. Amen? Listen, I, I'm not for stopping any supply of goods that's going on in our country tonight. Amen? I'm for the free-flowing. But you know what? Maybe God's going to have to teach us how to pray for our daily bread. I don't know. That's the way people used to live, and some people in our world are living right now. They're, they're searching for their next meal. I'm not pre prophesying anything. I'm not predicting anything. I don't know where this is all going, but you better take one day at a time, and you better trust God with some things. Amen? I didn't say don't prepare and don't do whatever, but I'm just saying to you, maybe we got to get used to the way some people have been living around the world outside of North America. We've been so spoiled rotten. It's like people in our, our citizens in Canada and U.S. are pulling fits like kids that are out of control because they don't have what they want when they want it. We've had it so good. Amen? Well, this thing with the mark of the beast, that's what's going on. I mean, come on, this is pretty bad. Global rule, you got it's required. If you don't take it, you die. You get your head chopped off. That's what happens to you. Amen? Boy, I'll tell you, we're not going to be here for that. Amen? Well, I'll tell you, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Amen? So anyway, so we're not going to read the whole chapter there. So it's an important time. You know what? Because individuals, okay, there's people that will receive Christ. I don't know what percent, but the Bible says, and we'll look at 2 Thessalonians 2, there, there will be a strong delusion that God's going to send. Some people have a, have a problem with that verse over in 2 Thessalonians, but they fail to understand that the people that entered the tribulation were people who rejected Christ, who didn't want God, so they get what they wanted. They don't want God, they don't get God. Amen? It's as simple as that. You just say, I have, I, that's a, why would God do that? Because they didn't want him to begin with. That's why they enter into that time frame. Amen? For you and I who are saved tonight, you're not entering into that time. Amen? So anyway, thank God for that. 
So anyway, so we see a lot of things going on. If you did the complete study on the, on the uh, what do you call it, the great tribulation there. So anyway, um, but look at verse 23 here. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 23. So then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. You know what? This has been a thing down through history. Amen? But you know what? The Jews, they, they think right now the Messiah has never come. They're still waiting for the Messiah. The word Messiah means anointed one. They think he has not come. And as a result, they fail to realize, yes, he did come. Jesus Christ is their Messiah. He's the one that God promised down through 4,000 years of history, from the time of the beginning of creation to when Christ came, it's been about 4,000 years when he was born. He is the Messiah. They rejected him. They crucified him. But that was all part of God's plan. Christ came here for one purpose, to die and pay for the sins of the whole world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because of that, people before the cross can know Christ, amen? People now, looking back, we can look to Christ, amen? Thank God for that, that you're saved tonight, amen? But anyway, there's been people, false Christ. It's been, I mean, constant. But you know what? There will be an opportunity. Satan hates the Jews. He hates the Jews. There are countries in our world would... If they had their way in the Middle East, they would push all the Jews into the Mediterranean Sea and get rid of them. If they had their way. They hate them. They hate them. They're God's special people. I didn't say they were saved. Amen. They're not saved. Just because they're born a Jew doesn't make them a child of God. They're, they're just a, a special people of God that are earthly. They're not a heavenly people until they get saved. And when they get saved, they're no longer Jew nor Gentile anyway. They're part of the bride of Christ. We set aside all of that. We said that so many times. So the thing is this. Um, there's a hatred. The Antichrist hates the Jews. There's leaders out here that in our world, different leaders, they hate the Jews. Man, we, we've seen dictators. They hate the Jews. We think of Hitler in World War II. Amen. I mean, you know what, you know what Hitler did? Hitler, basically what he did... He followed Darwin. It's what he did to the fullest extent. He believed what Darwin taught. He believed the white race was superior than any other race. That's what he did. And anybody else, he exterminated or tried to. That's what he did. That's what evolution teaches. And they still teach it in the schools. How about that? Well, they might not teach that. You know what? People like cherry picking. Just like they cherry pick out of the Bible, they cherry pick from Darwin's. Darwin was a racist. There's no question. Have you read his second book? I've read parts of it. It's terrible. It's terrible. Amen. I hard, even hard to say what he said in that book about the black race. You got to read that. And they say, oh, we, we believe in Darwin. Do you? No, you don't. Not with all the movements we've had in the last couple of years. Amen doesn't even correlate with what's been going on with all the, all the demonstrations across Canada and U.S. concerning our, our, our black people in our society, but yet they'll promote Darwin. How about that? You don't know Darwin. You don't want to know Darwin. If you knew him, you would never teach it in the public schools. Never. It's a bunch of hypocrisy, inconsistent. The Antichrist hates the Jews. Darwin, Darwin, listen, Darwin himself wanted to, basically what Margaret Sangster did in the, um, um, trying to think of the name of the group here. Um, my brain gone blank here. In uh, Planned Parenthood, she started that. You know what? She, she practiced eugenics. You eliminate certain groups of people in society. Go read it. Go, go Google it on the internet. Amen. People don't like to read about that stuff because we, we don't like the truth. We want to believe that she was just a wonderful person. She believed in Darwin. That's what she did. Study her. Amen. People don't know the truth. Amen. Well, listen, 
You know what? The devil, the devil, number one, doesn't want you to get saved. Number two, he doesn't want your kids to get saved and your grandkids to get saved. And, and if he can't get their soul, he doesn't want you to serve God. He doesn't want your kids to serve God. He doesn't want your grandkids to serve God. He doesn't want any Christian to serve God. So what will you do? He'll throw stuff at you that he knows works. <laughs> Amen. Why, why, why try new methods if the old ones work? We all have, we all have a weak point. Amen? We all have some spot. <laughs> Amen? We have a weakness somewhere in our flesh. The devil knows it. He knows that. Amen? And he'll keep on hitting you with that thing until you deal with it. And you say, I'm not going to let him win this time. It's like, man, you lift that shield of faith and one of those fiery darts hits you. Amen? Got to keep the shield of faith up and trust God. And thank God for his word, amen? So the Antichrist, the Antichrist, amen? Now let's look at the Antichrist a little bit here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So the passage in verse 24 also talks about great signs and wonders. So I want to take a little, uh, talk a bit about signs and wonders, okay? But in, look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, what kind of signs and wonders? And then we'll talk a bit about this because some people are a little bit confused. And again, as I've said concerning Calvinism, I'll say the same thing for the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement. I don't hate anybody. I just think they err. They err in the faith on certain matters. Amen? It's as simple as that. Let's go by the Bible. Let's not go by experience. Let's not go by our feelings. Let's not go by our emotions. My emotions change from day to day. So does yours. My feelings change from day to day. My experience Hey, listen, your, your experiences don't negate the Word of God. You say, I had this experience, and what you just shared with me contradicted the Bible. Listen, then that didn't come from God. If it came from God, you wouldn't contradict the Bible. But some people, they'll, they'll carry on like, well, this happened in my life, and this experience took place, and listen, what does the Bible say about it? That's what I do. Someone says, you know, uh, they tell me this experience, and I said, well, let me, let me share something with you here in the Bible, and I go through the scriptures, because it's not me. It's, it, listen, if, if we're all going to deal with things in life about experiences, feelings, and emotions, then let's throw the Bible away. What's the purpose for the Bible? If it has no bearing on what is right and wrong. So we use it in every aspect of our lives. We look to the Bible. We turn to the scriptures. Amen? That's what we need to do. And unfortunately, some Christians don't do that. They place more credence and weight in their feelings and experiences and their emotions than they do in the Word of God, and they get themselves into trouble. All it does is it genders confusion. That's all it does. So in 2 Thessalonians, I got to get there. You're there right now. Amen. I've read this passage. I won't go through every part of the verses, but I want you to see verse 9. Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, let's see here. Speaking of the Antichrist, by the way, verse 4, that's where the abomination of desolation comes in. Okay, he's sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God at the end of verse 4 there. Now let's skip down here. There's so much more. I mean, verse 8 is when we're coming back with the Lord. The Bible says, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. The Bible says Christ, as he's coming back, his, he is a, a two-edged sword. His word is a two-edged sword. This is a two-edged sword, but he is also the word also. We got the, the written word and the living word. Amen. And when he comes back, the Bible says in the book of Acts or in the book of Revelation, every eye will see him. And you won't need a cell phone for that. And you won't need a tablet or a computer. You don't need internet. You don't need Facebook and the metaverse. And you don't need Instagram and TikTok. Every eye will see him with all the, uh, uh, without the electronics. Every eye will see him. I'll tell you something, it'll be quite an event. We'll be coming with him. He does everything. We're just going to sit back and watch it all happen. It's going to be a terrible event for the people who never got saved. I can't imagine that. Amen? Well, I'll tell you, you don't want to meet him like that. You want to meet him as a lamb. Get saved now. If you're not saved, you're here or you're watching online, you better get saved. You better come to Christ. What are you waiting for? Listen, it's not going to get easier either. 
going to get tougher. So he says there in verse 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, you've got, you got to understand something. Some people think, they, they, again, in charismatic Pentecostal circles, they say this, you know, all these signs and wonders and all that. Did you know the devil, and this here is the devil incarnate, the Antichrist, will be able to do signs and wonders? Did you know that? Did you know the devil can do that? Did you know that? Some people don't know that. They think every time there's a sign of wonder, it's always from God. No, not necessarily. All you got to do is find out where is this person coming from? Amen? What is being taught, what is being preached through the sign or wonder that they're showing? Amen? And we're going to get into a little bit of that. So he says there, now watch this. And he says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We got more people having pleasure in unrighteousness than we've ever seen in the history of mankind. That's where we're, that's where we're at tonight, and it's going to get worse. Bible says, as the moon wax and wanes, when you goes from the new moon to the full moon stage, there's a waxing and a waning. Things are waxing worse. That's what's happened in our world tonight. Because I couldn't believe it. Someone says, this world's getting better. Really? In what way? Maybe you might say in technology, in your attitude, your, how, well, this is easier and this is easier. Yeah, what happens when it all crashes? Amen. Yeah, listen, some of us who've been around, we remember having slips of paper at the bank. You fill out a, a slip of paper for a withdrawal and a slip of paper for a deposit. Amen? I'll say, well, they're all protected. They got backup. They got all this. Are you so sure about that? We're becoming more reliant on the Internet than we've ever have in our world. That's a weak point. That's a weak point in our society. We can't do anything now without the internet, practically. Amen. Everything is run by the internet. What happens when things get shut down? The first thing you're doing is, wait, did I lose my, okay, I got no power. My modem at home doesn't have power, but I wonder if I got any bars on my phone. Hopefully, Bell or, or, or Rogers or, or Telus, they, their, their towers are still being pumped up with power. You know, they got the generators going. Oh, yeah, I got some bars left. What happens if those fail? What happens if you got zero bars? Some people are lost for even what to do anymore. Amen. Tell you, you remember White Wand? <laughs> you remember Wand? Amen. Shut down for a week. Close to a week for some, some more. Amen. You know what? You learn, you kind of go backwards in time a little bit. Okay, how are we going to do this? Amen. And if you're on a well, you don't have a generator. You got no water. Unless you got a well, you can dip a bucket in it. If you got a drill well, you're kind of stuck. You know what? We're so dependent on so many things. We've lost touch with how people used to live. People, if you took people 100 years ago, and brought them here, they'd probably survive better than the average person on planet Earth because they knew how to make ends meet and work and live off the land. Amen. Anyway, I'm just stating the truth here. But we live in a world full of pleasure. It's all about pleasure, pleasing self, pleasure and unrighteousness. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, the Bible says to Paul's letter to Timothy. Amen? So the Bible says, you think it's bad now? Wait till the tribulation. Amen? And we won't, listen, we're not here. It said, the Bible says, it will be totally given over to unrighteousness. You think Noah, the time of Noah was bad. This is multiplied times worse. We said so many times in the scriptures, the events, the judgments that will take place, the, the, the climate, the situation that this world will be in will be far worse than this earth has never, ever seen before. That's how bad it's going to be. Amen? Boy, glad I'm saved. And I'm glad 
I'm glad the Bible teaches, and I believe what the Bible teaches, the bride of Christ won't be present during that time. Amen. So what has he got? He's got powers. He's got signs. The Bible says they would be there. Listen, you remember Moses in Exodus 4? Do you know when signs started back in the Old Testament? It started in a place for the nation of Israel where God said, okay, you know, Moses said, hey, Lord, you know, you, you just told me that I'm going to lead these people, okay? Well, how am I going to be able to show them? You know, how am I going to be able to show them that I am their leader? Amen? I just can't step up and say, hey, everybody, stop for a minute. Um, God just said to me a while back that I'm your leader. Now follow me. You think everybody's going to start following you? No, so Moses says, hey, Lord, I need some help here. He says, okay, I'll give you some help. Put your hand inside your coat. Pull it out. Became leprous. Amen. Put it back in. Amen. Oh, it's not leprous anymore. He says, that's the first sign. Second sign, he says, put your rod, throw your rod down. Turned into a serpent. Amen. So it turned into a serpent. Okay. And you know what he said? Just do these things. Do these wonders before the Egyptians there, and then God's people, and all of that. He says, they'll believe. So what happens? You study the Bible, you'll find out God extensively used signs and wonders with the nation of Israel from their beginning of the 12 tribes right through history, even to this day. That's why Satan will throw signs and wonders and try to attract the Jews, try to get to the Jews in such a way that you would ever, never seen. Unfortunately, people today are, are just as culp much culprits for signs and wonders as the Jews were. You remember the time when, you know, the Bible says there back in Exodus, when he went through those ten judgments? Do you remember the magicians? Do you understand that the first three miracles the magicians copied? He said, I don't believe that could happen. Then you don't believe 2 Thessalonians 2, where the devil incarnate has the power for signs and lying wonders. Do you believe that? You, do you believe anybody on this world is possessed by the devil? Come on. Yeah, they are. There's people possessed by the devil under the complete control of the devil. You don't think he can do any wonders? Of course he can. So we think that every time there's a wonder, it's from God. Really? You better know where that's coming from. So in Deuteronomy 13, go over there for a minute. I think this is a two-parter. Deuteronomy 13. And again, I'm not trying to be unkind with anybody, but the problem is we think our experiences and our feelings and our emotions you know, if I had this, I don't care. Don't show me what the Bible says. I don't want to know what the Bible says. And by the way, if you do take it from the Bible, are you rightly dividing it? There's principles of Bible study and Bible interpretation. We went through a little semester of that in our Bible Institute, hermeneutics. How to study the Bible. Amen? Deuteronomy 13. Now watch this. So the Lord tells them, that, listen, guys, I, I, I'm going to give you a test here. Here's what you need to do. If someone comes along, okay, and they're a prophet, look at verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and hath given thee a sign or a wonder, okay? Lots of signs and wonders in, in the Bible, especially Old Testament and in the life of Christ in ministry and will be again in the tribulation. So he says, and the sign or wonder come to pass. So the case here is it's coming to pass. By the way, in the tribulation, the Antichrist will perform signs and wonders that will come to pass. If people believe that a sign or wonder, all signs and wonders come from God, they will be deceived in the tribulation easily. That's a piece of cake, amen? Then he says, where if he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods. Now, wait a minute. So, a sign and wonder takes place, and they say, let's go after other gods. That's in verse 2. Which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So the case is this. This prophet has powers with signs and wonders, but he's saying, go after this God, not the God that you have right now. Not the Lord God, Jehovah. Okay? 
Verse 3, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. So even if the thing comes to pass, the Bible says to Old Testament Israel, don't listen to them because they're guiding you, leading you away from what God said. So let's roll the clock to 2022. Someone's teaching something in a church, a pastor, a denomination's teaching something that leads you contrary to the scriptures. He says, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them, okay? Now watch this. He says, the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Boy, we, we have a lot of dead people today that are preaching stuff that is going contrary to the word of God leading people astray because of some visions and dreams and, and feelings and experiences and all of this stuff, there'd be a lot of dead people out there, dead preachers, dead false prophets, if that was the case. So the, the big thing you got to remember is it comes to pass, but just because it comes to pass, it doesn't mean it's okay. Where are they leading you? Where are they leading you? Are they leading you to God or away from God? Are they leading you to the Word or away from the Word? Well, I'm going with that verse, you know. We, well, we don't, we don't, that verse, we don't look at that one. No, we don't. No, okay. Mm-hmm. He says, why? He says, you'll be put to death because he hath spoken to you to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust you out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So the Bible speaks of this. As you can see, the, the basis for truth is not miracles, signs, and wonders. If it was, if that was the only criteria for truth, then why did God put that in there? Why did he put, test the prophets, test them, amen? It's just not the sign or wonders, come. it's coming to pass like they said. So, you know, these people, you know, in the horoscopes and people, they, these uh, soothsayers and they, they, they tell, you know, all these prognosticators out there, you know, on the internet and all these things, let me t read your fortune, put your palm out here and we'll just tell you where life is taking you. No, no, no. You say, well, man, they hit the nail on the head. Well, there's some things they just, they just know is common. And even if they did, listen, let me tell you something. You can't say for sure it's from God. Amen. Some Christians are involved in stuff like that, unfortunately. So what is God doing here? Well, God's going to... In the, in the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist, that's what he's going to do. So look what the Bible says. Let's roll forward to 1 Corinthians 1. What does God have to say? Oh, man, there's so much he has to say about that. You just got to read your Bible. And you know what? If you don't have divisions in the Word of God, we know the basic division is old and new. The whole book's for us, but it's not all written directly to us. There are certain things God told certain individuals to do. Amen? And so we got to be able to discern that. Amen? Jew, Gentile, and the church. Which one? Which one? What is it? What's, what's being spoken? Who's, who's the audience? Amen? We can learn from it. That's why the whole book's here. We need to have the history book. It's here. The whole book is history. Amen? So watch this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I guess I'm in Matthew here. i got to move over. That's where my page was. 1 Corinthians 1, you're there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 22. Look what the Bible says. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks after wisdom. You're going to find there's a consistent theme in God's dealing. And his main emphasis you know what? The, all the lost Gentiles that enter the tribulation, God's mainly dealing with his earthly physical people, but they're just, they're just there. They're lost, they're just there. But his main focus is on the nation of Israel. You study the Old Testament history, when 
God chose Abraham, and you study that line right through the Old Testament. If there was any nation that interacted with those people, God included them in the text. If they didn't, he didn't include them in there. He put that information in there. We studied Daniel. He put a lot of history in there. It's amazing in the book of Daniel. But his main emphasis was those people. That was his main emphasis. So what happened was, so they, they're given to signs. They were. They were given over to signs and wonders. That's what they wanted. And so 1 Corinthians 1, for the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks, after wisdom. You know what? So when we look at these passages, you've got to understand some things here. Look at uh, Matthew 12. We'll go back there now. We're going to flip-flop a little bit. You remember, you remember Jonah and the whale? Jesus talks about that in the New Testament. Do you ever read that passage? Oh, there's a whole bunch you can preach and teach. We've already covered that. Who knows how long? Months and months ago. <laughs> we're, we're, we're way past that. Verse 38, certain of the scribes, Matthew 12, 38, Scribes of the, and, the, and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would a sign from thee. Come on, give us a sign. He's already given them signs. What kind of signs? Healing people, raising people from the dead, cause the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak. Amen? That's what he's done. He's, he's, he's multiplied the loaves and fishes. Amen. He's done everything. Come on, what else do you need? Old Testament said he promised when the Messiah would come, the Lord God Jehovah says when your Messiah comes, he'll be doing all of that. They're saying, we want a sign from you. Hmm. He answered and said unto them, an evil, an adulterous nation seeketh after a sign. What are you looking for a sign? Amen. Why, why would you be looking after a sign after Jesus said that? You know what God gave us? This book. You know what? In the early church, they did not have the complete Bible. They had Old Testament. The, can the canon of scriptures as we have tonight did not exist in the early church. It was being compiled. God was using the different writers Amen? And now we got 66 books. And the thing was this. Okay, we had old, they had Old Testament. They could even preach the gospel from that. But there were some things that were new that had never been said before. How do you know if that was the truth or not? Hmm. But anyway, so here Jesus says, you know what? Let me tell you something. An evil adulterous nation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Watch this. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's that? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Amen. Thank God for that. Look over to, uh, let's see here, Luke chapter 16. You remember the Lazarus and the rich man? Lazarus and the rich man. It's all throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, and then things kind of change after, especially when you get into the other epistles of Paul went into Romans and so forth and forward because a lot of them are somewhat chronological. So watch this. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus, you know the, the account here, there's a rich man. By the way, it doesn't mean if you're rich you're going to hell, but that's where this rich man ended up. Salvation is not based upon on whether you're rich or poor. It's based upon whether you believe or not. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. Do you believe on Christ or not, okay? So anyway, but this rich man, the Lord Jesus, gives this, this account here. And by the way, it's literal. The Jehovah Witnesses say, no, that's a parable. Why? Because they don't believe in a literal burning hell. That's why. So they say, no, that's not. There's even a verse in Ezekiel, and it says this. Ah, doth he speak in parables? That's what they do. They throw that little thing in there and say, ah, that's just a parable. Oh, the Lord never uses real names in a parable. There's a man named Lazarus in this parable. 
Amen? There's real fire. There's real flames. Flames. Some, even some Christian writers. Man, I, I, I was shocked. Over the years, and uh, you know, you get to know some of these preachers and stuff. I'm, I'm different circles, all different circles. Some will say, oh, it's just the memory he's talking about. No, he's talking about a real, literal burn in hell. It's just people don't like the idea of hell. We even struggle with it. You know, I, I, I tell someone, listen, the Bible says if you don't receive Christ, you're going to hell. We don't like to even use the word hell. We struggle with it. But Christ spent more time on hell than heaven. You ever read that over in Mark chapter 9, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched? He said it three times. There is a real hell. Amen. Listen, God's a just God. He's a balanced God. Yes, he loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. But you've got to believe on him. If you don't believe on him, you'll end up in hell. Well, I, I don't believe in Jesus, and I don't believe in God, and I don't believe that Bible is true. Well, okay, well, you're going to end up in hell. Well, I don't believe in hell. doesn't matter if you don't believe it or not. You're still going there unless you get saved. People don't like that. This book is so narrow. There's only one way to heaven. How do you get to heaven? You've got to be saved through Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the definite article, one way. Not, well, this road and this religion and this cult and this, oh, those people, they worship, oh, gods and different gods, and, oh, they're okay because they're so kind and they're so nice and they're so helpful. You know, before my wife got saved, she was part of the Mormon church. Man, they would do things and try to help and fix things around your house outside. She was a single mom and all that kind of stuff. So how can they be wrong? They're so nice. That's shame on Christian people who do believe this book as we should believe it, and we're not kind to people. Shame on us. Just, well, man, you ever see those churches, Jehovah's Witness? Man, they build the church just like that, and they get all the carpenters, electricians, and everybody on a weekend, and they build the church. How do they do that? They can't be wrong. Look at that. Yes, they can be. It's according to God's Word. It's not according to your kindness. I believe Christians ought to be kind. Listen, if you're walking after the Spirit, you, you're supposed to be kind. You're supposed to be loving and forgiving. Amen? Christians ought to be able to work together. I believe that the last close to two years we've been dealing with has been dividing more pastors, churches, congregations than you've ever seen, and homes and families. Serious. It has. It has. Amen? I was talking to a preacher a while ago. He told me, he says, you wouldn't believe the churches that are fighting over stuff. It's just a division. It's neutralizing the work of Christ. Turn the, the, on each other and fight with each other. That's what's going on. Hey Amen. Well, I'll tell you, it's terrible. So anyway, you got this rich man, the beggar. You know, he was pretty in sore shape. He's full of sores, verse 20, and, and he was laid at the gate. He's eating the crumbs which fell off the rich man's table, verse 21. He died, he was carried to Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man, he died and he went to hell, verse 23. And anyway, he cried, verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of the finger in water and cool my tongue. Listen, that's a real flame, that's a real tongue, that's real water. This is not, you know, people, you can't spiritualize this thing. And Abraham said, verse 25, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. It's, it's, it's interesting. People in hell have the complete memory, and God tells us when you get saved, you end up in heaven, and in eternity, we will not remember the former things, but the people in hell remember everything they said and did to reject the gospel. They remember everything. There's memory in hell. But the context is not the memory. There is a hell. There is a fire. Verse 26, and he, anyway, he goes down. So he says, okay. He says, no, we can't do that. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. He said, would you please warn them? Man, oh, come on. In other words, in so many words, pray, I hope, please send somebody to, to give them the gospel. I don't want them to come here. And watch this, verse 20. And Abraham said to them, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets. What's that? The word of God. 
Not signs, not wonders, not experience, not feelings, not emotions. The word of truth. Amen? Watch this. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if went one unto them from the dead, they will repent. He says, no way. He says, listen, they need to hear the Moses and the prophets. He said, no, no, no. You're, ta- you're in hell, and you're arguing with Father Abraham. You're in a real mess. That's what was going on. Watch this. He said, I got a better idea. If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And watch this. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Someone rose from the dead. His name was Jesus. They still didn't believe. They had Moses and the prophets. He's speaking to the nation of Israel there. They got a problem. They just they're, want signs and wonders. And even in hell, someone suggested, come on, someone raised from the dead, they'll believe for sure. He said, no, if they don't believe most prophets, they won't even believe if someone raised from the dead. And that's, that's what we need today. Oh, I had a guy who worked on a mink ranch there in southwest Nova while I was pastoring for four years down there. And when I was down there, what a, someone, I was, you know, every now and again they say, you know, there's the preacher. They call me reverend. I hate that. I hate that. No, I'm, I'm a preacher. There's only one who's reverend. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, it's the Lord God, Jehovah. As a matter of fact, the word reverend there in that Psalms is R, capital R, reverend. It's God's name. That's his name. He's reverend. I'm not reverend. The world says you're reverend. Amen. I had a doctor who called me reverend. I said, oh, no, there's only one like that. And anyway, this guy in the mink ranch, he says, listen, I, I, he asked me about Christ. He asked me about heaven and hell and asked me about questions about life. And when I got done, he said, listen, I just can't believe. I, I know this. If God would just show me a sign, I'll believe. I said, no, you wouldn't. He's already shown you a sign. His name is Jesus. He died and he was buried and he rose again. People won't believe the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the sign. Prophet Jonas, Matthew 12, verses 38 to to, to 40. People will not even believe that. Well, I'll believe if God did this and go to the sky from heaven and just show himself. Well, you're pretty presumptuous to be commanding God in your unbelief. (laughs) Amen? But that's the way the world is. No, he's not obligated to do that. He's not obligated. Amen. Um, Look at this, 1 Corinthians 14. So when we study this thing, we'll have to finish up next week. 1 Corinthians 14. Oh, there's so much in here. We can't go through a complete study on it. It would take weeks. But I need to say, because you've got to see the connection between the signs and wonders with the Antichrist and the tribulation, the connection to the Jews and their history. You study Old Testament. You go through all these different things. They're always looking for signs. I want to give me a sign. Give me a sign. Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous nation seeketh after a sign. I don't want nothing to do with that. I got the book here. I got the truth. I got everything God wants me to know in here. Amen. That's what I got. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, if you know anything about this, talking about tongues. This whole chapter, it's, it's, it's amazing. It gives, there was abuse of tongues in the early church in 59 AD. And Paul had to write this letter to correct them in that area, amongst a whole bunch of other things that happened in that early church. First Corinthians chapter 14. And so, I don't have time but to go through all of it. But, um, let's see here. Verse 22, he says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. Did you get that? The average church service that has people speaking in tongues that's amongst mostly believers. Mostly believers. He says it's not for them that believe. Do you know what the purpose for tongues were? To get the gospel out to people that they could hear the gospel in a different language or if they were able to speak that language, that they can hear it in their own language. It wasn't for believers. It's not to them that believe. It's a sign for them in the early church there. And they were abusing that thing. Watch this. And he says, but to them that believe not... It's to them that believe. You ever read Acts chapter 2? Remember the time, day of Pentecost? Peter preached. There was Jews, ga- Jews, did you get that? Jews <laughs> gathered 
at that Jerusalem at the time of the Feast of Pentecost, and they were they were from all over that part of the world, all over, spread out, and they spoke different languages, these people that came. Peter stood before them. He preached the gospel to them. They heard, the Bible says, in their own tongue. It was in their own language. They heard that was a miracle. Why? Because it was for them that believe not. He preached the gospel. The Bible says towards the end of the chapter that 3,000 souls were saved. They, were, they got saved. They believed the word. They were baptized and added to the church in one day. How about that? Wow. That's an amazing event. So the tongues are not, so, and again, well, there's a whole bunch you can say about the tongues issue here. You say, it seems kind of confusing. I've been in a church service and uh, just like, rrr, rrr, rrr. verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Huh, wonder why God put that, because they were doing the same thing that they're doing here 2,000 years later. What people learn from the Bible is they don't learn from the Bible. We, we, we keep on repeating the same things that God corrected through the Apostle Paul, a, a congregation of believers that were abusing something. If you say you have the gift of tongues, he gave some things. And by the way, the reason why this is still available at this point is because they didn't have all 66 books of the Bible. We have all the revealed word of God tonight. They didn't. They didn't. So, it was signs. It, notice there in verse 22, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So again, for them that don't, be, for them that don't believe. Amen? Um, now watch this here. Um, we'll just wrap up with one thing here. Let's see if I can get this here. Go to uh, Mark 16. We'll quickly look at that, and then we're done. We've got to stop. It's <clears throat> Mark 16. So we got the early church. Here's 33 or 30 A.D., roughly, because Christ was born in 4 B.C. That's what it was when you, do the, when you study the, the, the chronology. It's about 4 B.C., he was 30, 33 and a half years old, okay? John's gospel frames the Passover pretty nicely in the gospel of John. Now watch this. So he, he talks about some things that would take place. He's speaking to the 12, the, or the 11, because, of course, Judas went and hung himself. And that's interesting because Matthew 10, verse 8, says that they all, all 12 had powers to do things. All 12. All 12. Don't forget, the devil can do things. <laughs> Amen. One of them was the devil, the Bible, Jesus said. How about that? Think about that one for a while. So there's only 11 here. Judas went and hung himself, changed his mind. He repented. Amen. He didn't get repent to get saved, that's for sure. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, so verse 14, he appeared to them at me. He abraded them. That means he's scolding them because of their unbelief and hardness of heart. Amen? And, you know, they, he, here he is. He's risen, risen from the grave. Unbelief, unbelief. We got this idea. Oh, they all believe. No, they did not. They doubted this resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't comprehend all of that. So he tells them the Great Commission, verse 15, go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature. He that believeth is ba and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, I'll tell you, that's caused a lot of trouble, but all you got to do is look at both parts of the verse. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So what damns a person? Believing. That's a common denominator, not being baptized. Baptized doesn't save you. If that was the case, then the Bible contradicts itself because there's many other places where it talks about it's not your, that doesn't save your soul. But some people just got a problem with the and. They're connecting, believing, and baptizing. Just read the next part of the verse. 
And then he says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We're not going to go through all those things tonight. But let's keep on our soul. There's the, there's the signs. And the gospel went first to the Jew first, the Bible said. To the Jew first. That's what he did. Now watch this. So then after the Lord had spoken to him, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now watch this. They went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them. And I've underlined this phrase. You've got to underline it. Confirming the word with signs following. Why do you have to have signs in the early church? Why? Because they don't have the whole Bible. They don't have the New Testament. So if they said something and it wasn't in the Old Testament, amen, how do you know? Wait a minute. So they had signs to confirm the word. We don't need that. We got it all now. The word's been confirmed. We got it all. But people are living today in some churches and some denominations like the word's not complete and we got to have all these experiences and the word of knowledge and the, the tongues and all of this thing and they don't even use them according to the scriptures as I've already alluded to in 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible says one at a time in course and if there's no interpreter, keep quiet. There's just so many problems with what's going on in the charismatic and Pentecostal churches. And then we go on and on and on. I'm going to tell you, uh, just what is this for? God left us a book to make decisions, to, to follow it. Listen, this is the book for the church. It's the book for your home. It's the book for your marriage. It's the book for every part of your life. This is the book. This is what we need. Amen. We just got to follow it. Well, you know, someone's having experience. We don't want to offend anybody. Sorry. It's not accordance with the word. Don't worry, we're not going to stone you. We're not Old Testament, Israel. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> Kids in rebellion, they would, be, they would have been stoned in Old Testament. Cursing their parents in rebellion? Yeah. Anyway, let's stop there. We'll carry on part two next week on signs and wonders. Father, again, thank you. Thank you for your word. Now, Father, we ask your blessings now as... Lord God, as we go to you in prayer, and Father, we do ask you that you would just again help people understand, see the truth of the Scriptures, rightly divide the Scriptures, Lord God, and not be deceived, Lord God. Too many believers are easily led because they're not grounded in the Word, Lord God. They resort to feelings and experiences more than they resort to you, Lord God, and your written Word. So help us tonight. Pray for those who are lost. Pray you would touch their hearts and lives, Lord God. Now, Lord God, just again, just uh, meet with us as we go to you in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.